Uh, hi guys, my name is Ben Caro. Uh, like you said, I'm with Mozilla. Um, I don't directly work on Firefox OS. I dog food it, I test it. Um, I do some other kind of unofficial stuff with it. Uh, we have some awesome people in the house. So they're a little more directed, uh, directed at the project than me. So if you guys have any questions and I'm unable to answer them, we have the experts with us to go help me out. You get the hard questions. Um, okay. Yeah, this is me. Uh, I work for this place. I live here. That sort of thing. Um, a brief history just of cell phones. Um, first, there were brick phones. You guys have seen 80s movies. You've seen horrific old clunky phones, that sort of thing. And then since then, phones have gotten smaller, but feature-wise, they've all just been kind of the same. Um, around the year 2000, someone got the harebrained idea that it might actually be, be a good idea to... Uh, this on? Yeah to make them do something else. So we got this kind of cool thing. This is like an Ericsson R380, and it, it can do some kind of interesting things. Uh, yeah, it was a phone. It had a keyboard. It had a word processor. You could push some data back and forth in weird proprietary formats. Um, and this is kind of how smartphones progressed. Um, the web interface for this. Uh, does anyone here remember WAP? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was... Uh, a particular kind of misery that I try to forget. Unfortunately, a lot of this internet is still online, so banks and things like that, that had websites back then, just kind of had this and still have this, and they thought that would be acceptable for a mobile website. And until very, very recently, they, that's all they've done, is they just left this on there, and they hoped that smartphones had a browser that could see this kind of thing. Um, but as you can imagine, this is very, very limited. Um, and then something happened. Uh, there was a product announced, and there was a web SDK. There was, well, there was the web. There was no SDK. There was no uh, requirements for building applications. Uh, there was no big uh, bundle to download to compile applications for a single platform. We were promised the web. We were promised native applications across multiple devices. Um, and that's how we would build apps for the future. Unfortunately, what this turned out to be was a bunch of glorified stopwatch apps. Uh, it turned out to be kind of simple currency conversions. Things that JavaScript had access to do at the time was basically what you got. You didn't really have access to rich APIs to do things that a native application could do on a device. And so as a result, this never really took off. Um, what happened was six months later, there was an actual SDK released, and then we went back to walled gardens. We went back to only being able to code an application for a single platform at a time, and only the users of that platform being able to use your application. If you want, if you want a music player and you want to be able to use it on all devices, you needed to code for each and every single platform. And that ended up being frustrating. Um, so one other primary example I can think of historically was America Online. You had an account, you had access to the web, but you also had access to AOL exclusive content. So that was what they kind of stuck you with. Um, and if you were happy with that, that was fine, but you can always see the sunshine. You can see the rainbow over that nice tall wall. Kind of like I can see sunshine over there right now, but it's not over here yet. Um, so what's happened since then? That was 2006, and we're in 2013 now. We've got some pretty awesome technologies uh, that have been built that give JavaScript the ability to do a lot of the things that native applications can do on all the platforms. So like Hammer.js allows you to do multi-touch within the web. Um, jQuery is pretty much synonymous with JavaScript now. Uh, it's so ubiquitous in event handling, jQuery UI for UI elements. There's Angular and there's Ember for making different apps. Uh, there's a whole platform built on top of JavaScript that runs on any of the platforms that the web is on, which is fantastic. So we are finally at a level playing field with all of the existing platforms. We have access to multi-touch. We have access to a lot of different things. And uh, what happened as well is JavaScript got really fast. Um, Back when this originally happened, we're talking 2006 time, JavaScript was kind of slow, so you couldn't get the performance you needed to get a native app experience. Since then, we've gone through a lot of evolution of JavaScript, and we can, uh, 
we can now get near native performance or sometimes better than native performance on the JavaScript engine as compared to a native application. Um, one thing I'd like to share with you guys now uh, is a demo that was released a while ago called Banana Bread. And this is a three-dimensional game, a first-person shooter. This is all done uh, in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Um, and WebGL, right. That was one of the new technologies. Um, and this is basically what the web can do now. So it loads for a little bit. You don't actually have to download things. It loads it on the fly. And this is all handled in the browser. No, there's no plugins you have to download. It uses WebGL, which is built into all modern browsers. Um, yes. Uh, someone built a really cool, I'll go over it in a second. I guess we don't have any audio, but uh, I mean, you get the idea. So it's just as good as a native game, and we can do interesting things. Like, it usually takes a lot of horsepower to run a game like this. And the fact that we're able to do it in JavaScript demonstrates how far this platform has come. Um, one particular piece of technology that, was, uh, that we thank for being able to do that is uh, called uh, ASMJS and a library called mscripten to be able to translate uh, LLVM targets and, uh, in particular, C++ bytecode into JavaScript. So to do this, we actually have the Unreal Engine translated to JavaScript and then interpreted by your browser, which is really cool. It means that uh, potentially any of those games that you play that use the Unreal Engine, like Unreal Tournament, like Borderlands, things like that, should be able to be ported more or less seamlessly into a browser experience. Um, oh, come now. Presentations. I'm going to blame Flash on that one, <laughs> like I usually do. Um, Mozilla hasn't been sitting around doing nothing either. We have all of these cool. OK, fine. Yes. Go away. Uh, we've done a bunch of stuff to make uh, this platform just as good as native ones. So lots of SDKs, lots of hardware access. I really like the push notification API, so I can tell me when people harass me on IRC. Uh, there's some fantastic stuff in there for being able to access your network and things like that. And we've actually created a permissions model based on this so you don't have to give any application that you install all of this access to your device. We think that would be horrible, and we limit it to only what the application needs they can request. Uh, it's similar to uh, what's on the Android market in terms of the permission model. Um, and lastly, what's great is we, need, we want to uh, contribute all of these things uh, back upstream uh, to the other browser vendors, um, to all of the other people in the industry, uh, because we know that if, only, if this is only good for us, then it's not really good as a standard. It's just we've created another standard and another platform. We want people to actually use this. And to do that, we've, res we've registered all these with the W3C. Um, they're there for people to use. And additionally, um, Firefox on Android already has implemented a lot of these APIs. So if you're installing uh, Firefox OS uh, applications on uh, Android, you have the same access to the hardware that you would on Firefox OS, right? Mm -hmm. OK. In some cases, some APIs. Right. Cool. Um, one of the things that the benefit that you get from the web is it's easy to produce and easy to consume. You don't have walled gardens saying, you made this video on YouTube. You can only watch this if you're on YouTube, if you pay your YouTube subscription fee or something like that. And so when you have access to, we, we find that when you have access to all of the content of the internet, then that's really the best possible outcome. Uh, you want to be on a level playing ground with everyone else. And what that also means is that when you are producing things on the web that you will be using technologies that you already understand. You'll be using JavaScript, you'll be using HTML and CSS. You don't need to go learn huge, new, esoteric, otherwise useless programming languages in order to write something. You already, uh, the majority of people uh, who are coding uh, on the web already have the skills 
to be able to create a mobile application. And we think that's really valuable. Uh, the, the target that we have for this is replacing feature phones. So uh, we're, uh, with the hardware that we're using, it's targeting not necessarily the very top end of the market, although that is something that we're obviously interested in because early adopters are awesome people to be testing devices. Uh, but we're also uh, looking for kind of a, a ground up uh, distribution of the devices just because we see that the, the digital divide is, the, the, the have nots are kind of being left behind and no one is really considering what they're going to do to be able to what we can do to be able to bridge that gap, basically. And if we can replace flip phones, feature phones, that sort of thing, with smart devices, then we think we can really create something of value and kind of bridge that gap. Um, some of the design elements you can see and we can show you, uh, everything that you see is the web, down to the home screen, uh, down to the lock screen, the notification bar, all of the applications. It's all built using those, these technologies that I mentioned earlier. Uh, everything, like I said, is open standards, all of the APIs, um, the entire uh, source code for the project is open source, so you can go on GitHub and look at the source, edit the dialer if you want, uh, upload that to your phone, that sort of thing. There's, there's no special software on it. There's no special exceptions, is what I'm trying to say. Um, there's no single interface. We've made, a, we've made an interface. We call it Gaia. It's a good one. We like it. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the only one. If you want a special interface, or if, uh, if, you found them, if you found one that you like, we don't have any secret sauce in this one that, only, that, are, only, that it can only access some APIs. Everything has equal access to the, the underlying operating system, which is great because it gives people a lot of room to innovate uh, on that front. Maybe you don't like icons. You don't need the concept of icons. You could have a list. A list is just as valid in HTML. Um, and another awesome thing that we've tried to do is have multiple marketplaces. So now, if you're on iOS, you have the App Store. If you're on Android, you have the, the Marketplace. Or maybe you have the Amazon Store, but I've never heard of anyone else using that. Um, or Yeah, right. The Google Play Store is the mar what they changed the name of the Marketplace to. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that we try to do with this is we don't want users to be tied to one store. So if you run a company and you're distributing phones out to people, then it could be really valuable to you to be able to run your own marketplace. So if you all work for Ben's Widgets Incorporated and I give you all cell phones, maybe I want you to have this, uh, this version of an app. So I can say, come here. This is my official sanctioned app store. You can go grab this. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to only use my app store. You can go use someone else's. If it's, so if one prevails in the community and becomes the best, there's no reason why you can't do that. Um, and lastly, there's no real walled garden. Everything, like I said, the source code is online. Um, it's all open and available. It's free to modify uh, under MIT, GPL, and BSD license. No, GPL, MPL, and BSD licenses. Um, everything is the web. This is an example of the home screen. This is the lock screen. Um, these are some of the devices. Uh, this is the Keon, right? Yeah. Uh, this is a, a geek. We've partnered with a company called Geeks Phone out of Spain. And they're, uh, they're producing developer devices. So if you're interested, you can go to their website. You can order a device. You can get it delivered. Uh, this one is called the Keon. It's uh, the mid-level device. And they don't, they're, they're very inexpensive uh, compared to other things on the phone market. But the experience that you get with it is definitely top notch. Um, don't think that just because it's an inexpensive device, you're going to be getting a subpar experience or everything is going to be slow. It's, uh, it's definitely responsive. It's snappy. It's useful. Um, additionally, beyond the single devices, there's community hardware support. So if you guys are familiar with phone hacking or anything, there's a community called XDA developers. And they specialize in getting uh, new operating systems, updated operating systems on phones. So after Samsung has abandoned you or HTC has abandoned your phone, you can go there and get the latest version of Android for your phone. Likewise, they're not just limited to Android. They've actually done some work in porting Firefox OS to other devices, 
which has been really cool and we appreciate a lot of the community support because they file bugs with us. They let us know when things aren't working and we have a better product just because of it. Um, it uses the Android build system. Uh, the underlying part does. Um, there's no more Java in it. We've ripped all of that out. But uh, you can certainly just go clone it from GitHub, tell it what device you want to configure and build it, and it will just give you an image that you can flash on your phone. It's not too difficult. And because of that, it's really easy to be able to set up a development environment and do a little hacking if that's what you're interested in contributing. Um, the question is, how can you contribute? You can port to new devices, um, join XDA developers and see what's going on there. Uh, use the open web standards. Uh, the MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network, is a great resource to be able to find things uh, in terms of web development. Lots of resources on there, whether you're uh, just looking for, like, uh, to be able to use CSS to correct some things, or if you're looking for some weird JavaScript library and how things interact. There's a lot of information on there that can be valuable to you. Um, it's very easy to package your mobile site up as an application. So you literally create a manifest file uh, that tells us a little bit of metadata about what you want the application to be, uh, what permissions you want, where you want to be able to distribute it, and you can send that to us and we can list it in a marketplace. Um, so it's, it's rather easy to create an application out of maybe a mobile, an existing mobile website that, you've ar that you have already created. Um, some of the people who have contributed have contributed things to, to sites they don't own, like uh, someone made one for the mobile interface for Spotify, which is really cool, just because he wanted to be able to have a native app for Spotify on his phone. So he was able to bundle that up and install it on his phone, and it works just like a regular application. It's pretty awesome. Um, if you're getting on the entire bandwagon and you want your, uh, you're thinking about you wanting an application to be distributed in other places and other parts of the world, then there are some things you need to consider. Cultural implications, like data is really expensive. So is there some way you can either compress the data or ship this over a text message or find some way not to be costing your customers so much money? Because if you're going to be costing your customers money or causing them annoyance, then they aren't going to use your application. Um, and build apps to be uh, context aware. So one of the interesting things about making uh, websites and that you've probably found already if you've tried is that when you try to view it on multiple devices of different screen sizes, the layout can change wildly. So we've created a bunch of tools in the browser um, and in the Firefox Swiss OS simulator to be able to simulate multiple device sizes and resolutions. So you can create one, you can create a website for a tablet, and a phone and a, and a desktop web browser without too much additional difficulty. We think this is, these kind of tools to make developers' lives easier is really important for them adopting the platform. Um, that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions for me? That's a really good question. Uh, do you have an answer for that? Yeah. I think in the permissions manager, you can uh, enable and disable different permissions. Uh, there's also different levels of permissions. So some of the apps that are built into the phone have what are called uh, certified app permissions. Mm -hmm. So they have special level of permissions that only apps that ship with the phone can have. Sure. Eventually, we'll support having those higher level permissions for other types of apps. Uh, okay. The second level are packaged apps, which actually have an Android style permission model where you actually can see it in your app list and manage the permissions individually and things like that there. The third are, are regular web apps that you might load in through the browser, uh, bookmark your home screen and stuff like that, in which case you'll get an on-demand permission model, much more akin to what you see in desktop browsers today. Right, the second question. Um, so can I code in my own paper programming language, which, sorry, is not JavaScript? Um, you can, uh, if you can turn it into uh, like M script in, convert it to JavaScript somehow. Um, if it's a native language and is an LLVM compilable target, you can turn it into JavaScript. Okay, well, so uh, Firefox OS is running a Linux kernel. Um, and is there a way for me to develop for the user space running directly on that kernel? Uh, I don't think that's a, we don't have much support for that. It's open source, so there's no reason you can't do that. Right. But that's yeah. definitely not one of the targeted features. <laughs> Thank you.
write code that works on all the platforms that I care about, and that includes desktop, server, et cetera, running whichever, and also on a phone. And you know, Android doesn't seem like the, uh, the ideal platform for that, so I was wanted to see what my options were. Okay, um, I don't have much. Um, one other thing I felt like sharing with you guys, um, if you guys are curious about playing with this and uh, you don't have a Firefox OS device at home, uh, you don't feel like porting it to a different device, we do offer something called the Firefox OS Simulator. Um, you could probably Google finding that, but the, the name that's, that it's used for a long time is R2D2B2G. Um, so you can go download that. It's a 100 megabyte add-on for Firefox, and uh, you can go to what, uh, what is it, Tools, Web Developer, and then the Firefox OS Simulator, and it will start it up, uh, it'll start up in a new window, a Firefox OS uh, session in your, on your desktop. And additionally, if you go into the, the Downloads Manager, you can create an application and you can upload it to it uh, just from your Firefox add-on manager, which is really cool. And it helps development a lot just because you're able to rapidly prototype a new application send it to your simulated device, test it out, and do a lot of refinements there without having to do back and forth with a real device. So I don't believe that we're actually shipping through a carrier yet. It's just the, just the developer devices so far. Right, right. Yeah, the, the, first two, uh, the first two actual shipments of phones will be on sale in a couple different countries in South America, I think currently in the next month, month and a half, through Telefonica and their operations and uh, local carriers down there. Uh, after that, rolling out to a couple of other countries that have, we've already announced, Spain, uh, a couple of Eastern European countries as well, and I think that's, that's going to be most of the activity for the summer. I think, I think six or seven countries total. Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you port to another device? Let's say I've got a I've got a, an HTC Droid Incredible that uh, used to be connected to Verizon before I dropped back to a feature phone. Mm -hmm. uh, how would I go about porting this to that? So uh, the way for porting to other devices, because we're using the Android build system, we're already compatible with a lot of Android devices that are out there. So uh, the thing to look for is does it have community support? One of the big uh, community Android builds is called Cyanogen Mod. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Cyanogen does run on the Incredible. Yeah. So you're able, uh, so with Cyanogen, it's split into multiple repositories. Many are for the software that build Android, and a few are for the hardware support for that device. And you can take that rep the, the one Git repository that has the hardware support for the device, and I believe there's a script that allows you to take that URL and import it into the Firefox OS build system. And then you can target that and create a new build for yourself. Okay. And, and that's on the SDA side? Or? Yeah. Okay. okay. That's probably the best yep. place to ask questions okay. about it. Yeah. <laughs> Although I did find a project today that I'll, I'll give you a link to that for ICS based Android devices, you can actually basically run the script that compiles the entire image for you. Oh, this very, thing very was, uh, it was running gingerbread when, when I gave up on it. So I, I don't know if it'll support ICS or, or Jelly Bean. I, huh? yeah. I, I think the hardware may be a constraint or maybe it would Yeah, I think it, it, for, that, for that it depends on whether or not the OEM actually shipped updated binaries and actually ported ICS or ported that device to ICS. Yeah. Another cool thing is if you guys have Raspberry Pi sitting around, there's been builds of that for the Raspberry Pi. So you can use that for some really cool things. Like uh, we're going to be using some for billboards at our office. So just having uh, slideshows basically of live web pages uh, on a TV just powered by a Raspberry Pi and Firefox OS. That's happening, right? All right. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Oh, yeah.
Um, there is a Firefox hacking session uh, down in the lobby tomorrow evening run by B. Kranza over here. Uh, would you like to say a word? Okay, guys. Thank you.